I wanted to talk about the general concept of if you might need to keep some old software running, but your computer is, you need to have at some stage upgrade your computer to a new operating system, and it, this is going to cause compatibility problems, um, and the software won't work anymore. So I've got a, a bit of background information in here as well, including a, a nice pretty picture, colourful chart that I did a while ago, so I'll show you that when I get to the right point. Okay. So, first thing I wanted to briefly cover was how to plan for running the next operating system or if any, not one in particular, but in general this is, not, um, not one in particular, but yeah. So, um, if, for, consider the case of a person who only uses the software that comes with their computer, nothing else. So you use Mail, Safari, Calendar, Contacts, don't, use, don't install anything else. It's very likely that a person in that category can upgrade very quickly to the new operating system because... Everything that comes with the operating system is supplied by Apple and has already been tested as being compatible with the new operating system. Therefore, you don't need to worry about the software that you, you're using not being compatible because Apple's supplying all that software and they update it all at the same time. So that's unlikely to have any delays is the main point there. However, it is a good idea to, to not rush into a brand new major operating system on day one because there's bound to be bugs. And if there are bugs, you may find that you're, even though you're using Apple standard software, something goes horribly wrong for you and it causes all sorts of problems. So it's a good idea to wait a few days and let the adventurous people go first and then they can find out the, the oh my God, this has deleted all my data kind of bugs and, and then deal, and you then don't have to face that sort of problem. So that's a good idea. Now, in the case of an iOS device, so there's an iPhone or an iPad, if you rush in and upgrade to a new version, it's generally very difficult to downgrade back to the previous version again, so don't do it until you're sure that you're ready to do that. Um, however, on a Mac, you can downgrade to the previous version, but it is quite a complicated process. You've got to, you have to have a backup of your previous system, and you have to wipe the computer and restore the backup, which is time-consuming, and you need to know what you're doing to get it right. So you should plan to not need to go back to the previous one, but just in case, have a backup so that you can go back in case you need to. Um, so it's, good, it's always a good idea to have a full backup of your computer before you upgrade to a new major version. I always make sure I do that. In fact, I keep that one long term just so I can always go back to the previous system later on if I need to, even just temporarily. Okay, so... Let's now move on to the case of somebody who has mostly software that comes with a computer but a few other things that they installed. So you might have a, two or three applications or a small number of things. So there's a few things you've got, not a, not a significant number. As I've already mentioned, anything that's supplied with the operating system will be updated at the, as, as part of the OS upgrade, so there's nothing to worry about with them. So what you do have to worry about is that ones that you've installed separately. So this is stuff which you've downloaded from, from a developer's website, you've got it from the app store, wherever it might be. So whichever method you've used to get it onto your computer. So that software is stuff you need to concentrate on to work out, is this possibly going to be a problem if I run the next operating system? And they fall into one of the following possible categories. It might work fine with no problems at all, just keep working. That does happen a few times. I have, I have quite a lot of applications, and I have encountered a few that did just, just worked. <laughs> Didn't have to do anything. They may release a free update to fix any minor cosmetic ranging to major this doesn't work kind of problems. So in which case, you just need to make sure you wait until that update's available, or at least find out whether it exists. In some cases, we're not going to bother supporting the next operating system version unless you buy the next version of our software, which is quite common with bigger things. Things like um, Microsoft Office tends to do this sort of thing. Um, they officially stopped supporting Mac OS X as of 10 point, Office 2011 this was. Um, you, they supported up to 10.12 but not 10.13, even though it turned out that it worked all right. They just wouldn't guarantee that. So if you wanted to be get support from Microsoft and you're running High Sierra, you had to actually buy a new version of Office to be sure that it will work properly. Or, the worst case, the application is never updated and it's not compatible with the new operating system. So the usual case there is the developer has decided they're not going to work on the program anymore, or 
it's too hard to do, do some absolutely massive amount of rewriting work or something like that, and they just it's, a, it's just never going to get updated. Um, or they've died in some cases, or um, if, they're sm if they're a small developer and not a, com a larger company. Um, so there may be many many reasons for this, but generally speaking, there are a few applications quite often in this category. Something will not work at all in, on the next operating system. So those are the four major possibilities. So looking at them in general terms, the first place you should check with is the developer of the software if you're not sure about whether a particular thing is going to work. So find the developer's website. If you got it from App Store, there's actually a um, link on the App Store page for the application to go to the developer's website. If you got it from somewhere other than the App Store, you'll need to know where you got it from or do a Google search and find the developer on the internet and hopefully they've got information on their website explaining what the what their policy is for supporting their application, what their, poli what their impression is of how compatible it is with the next operating system, that sort of thing. Usually the the well-behaved developers provide enough information that you can actually find all this information, which is fine if you've got a small number of applications to deal with because you don't have to go and hunt in a lot of places. In my case, I have hundreds of applications and it's not practical, so that's the third category I'm going to get onto in a minute. <laughs> if you have no luck getting information from the developer, because they, they won't reveal anything yet, and there are a few that will not say anything about whether or not this software is compatible with the next operating system until after the new operating system is available, so you just may not be able to find out until after the new OS is released. Try an internet search. Ask other people that you know also use the software or see if you can find other people who do. Or try this website I've mentioned there, roaringapps.com. That's one which has been around for several years now. Its name comes from the fact that it was originally written for Mac OS Lion, hence the roaring reference. Um, the idea was that they're writing a user-contributed database of, effectively they have a big list of applications, operating system versions, and comments that people have made for, I found this worked, or it didn't work, or this thing didn't work, or whatever it might be. So there might be some useful hints on there. You do have to take it with a grain of salt, though, because it's not um, necessarily 100% accurate, and it may be that one particular person had a problem which only affected them because they were running some particular combination of software or something like that. So at least it might give you some ideas. And if it says, everybody's, everybody says, this is hopeless, it doesn't work, then obviously it's, it's not going to work. But if one person said it worked, one person said it doesn't, didn't, then you've got more research needed, unfortunately. As I've alluded to already, some, in many cases you can't get an update for the application until after the new OS is released. Because the developers, particularly with the App Store, developers are not allowed to release new applications via the App Store until Apple f approves the final version of the developer software, which happens about a week before the OS is released. So generally, an App Store update which ha fixes problems with the new OS may not be available until the day of the new OS being released or later. Um, if they're distributed another way, then that, that's entirely up to the developer how quickly they release it. They may release it early, um, more likely they'll wait until close to the final day. Quite a few that I use are within a month or two of the OS, but a few of them you don't know until months later, so it can vary quite a lot, which I just mentioned, yep. Okay, if you have what I would classify as critical applications, so there is some application that is essential to your workflow, there is something that you are doing with your computer that must keep working for business reasons or personal reasons, or whatever it might be, or you have an awful lot of applications and it's too hard to go and find information about all of them. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> um, so in that case, if it's something vitally important, you may have to test it yourself to make sure that it works. Um, and that's also the, a good solution if you have a lot of things to test. Um, if you are trying to do this for an iOS device, that's an iPhone or an iPad, it's much better to do this if you have more than one device, in which case you can upgrade one of them and try it on that without <coughs> disrupting your main one. I now own several iPod Touches, iPads, and at least two iPhones. I don't have much that can run the next operating system yet, but I, up until now I've, ha I've been in a position where I've been able to upgrade one device, try things on it before I upgrade the new one, but I don't have as many now, so that, that makes it a bit tricky, um, because most of my test devices are no longer supported by the next operating system, so that's, that's always a hassle. If you don't have a spare device, 
find somebody else who has already upgraded or is willing to, and perhaps they might be able to install the app that you use, see whether it works. That might be an option. Depends on what costs, of course. If it's a hundred dollar app, then they may not be able to want to install it on their device because they don't want the app and it's cost too much. On a Mac, your easiest option is usually to have a spare external drive. So you get an external hard drive, whatever it might be. Typical one of these sorts of things. Um, you <coughs> set it up as a clone of your main drive. So you need cloning software, something like Carbon Copy Cloner or Super Duper. You clone your internal drive to the external drive. You then boot your computer from the external drive and you upgrade the external drive to the new operating system. And then while you're running in that environment, you can then test the, all your software and see how well it behaves. This is the sort of thing that I usually do for myself about a week or two before the new OS is released, preferably after the sort of the final um, pre-release version is available, which I can't always tell because Apple doesn't actually tell us which one that is, but it, I can usually get a good impression anyway. So that because I'm doing that anyway, that means there's a fairly large chunk of software which I will be testing. Um, however, I have already, <coughs> because on macOS Catalina is dropping support for quite a few old applications, I've already started to split off stuff that I know is not going to work, so I'm not going to even bother trying to test things which I know won't work. They've all gone to this Mac Mini rather than being on my laptop. Um, as a general piece of advice, if you're tempted to try beta operating system versions, don't. <laughs> In fact, this year Apple has been putting up a big warning on the download pages for for thrill seekers only, or words to that effect. If you're trying if you're trying to run a beta version of the operating system. If, the, the issue with running the early versions is they're likely to have bugs. The earlier you get before they're released, the more and more and more bugs there will be. Therefore, the very, very first versions were really, really horrible. As they release new updates, they get better and better, but they're not really going to be um, public for public general public consumption until the final release that's available in September normally. So um, the earlier you, earlier you start, the more likely you are to run into strange problems that have nothing to do with your software, but just because the operating system is not stable yet. So not a good idea generally unless you know, you've got a spare device that you can test it on, which Shane is holding up. Just to tell me that's what he's done. I, I also have done that. I have actually now installed Mac OS Catalina on a spare Mac Mini. I have installed iPad OS 13, but these are all beta 4, developer beta 4 on... Um, one of my iPads, and I've installed it on one of my iPod Touches. So I've got, I have actually got them all running now, and I've seen them working, and much to my surprise, they work well enough. They haven't crashed on me, so they're at least, at least doing nothing on them, apart from just what's built in, they seem to be reasonably stable so far. So, But Apple still has warnings up saying, don't try this unless you're brave. So um, I'll follow their advice. Do they offer running No. What they expect you to do, though, is if you do test them, they expect you to provide feedback if you run into any problems. And they supply a feedback application for that purpose. Yeah. So they're in, in user feedback. They've got two different groups of beta testers. There's the, the developers who actually need to be running this stuff so they can get their software ready in time for the new operating system. And then they've got the public beta, which anybody can join. And that one is just for people who are interested in trying it out before it's available. But I, I generally recommend that you, you need to be... Um, either a very brave soul to upgrade your main device or have a spare device to test it on. Um, and one problem that's coming up with the, the current round of betas is that they've changed some of the cloud syncing features. For example, Reminders has a whole bunch of new, new functionality. If you run the new beta versions, you, it asks you, do you want to upgrade your Reminders? If you do that, all your old devices will no longer be able to access your Reminders anymore. And there's things like that. And some of the earlier betas were apparently deleting large chunks of people's iCloud data. So um, it may not just affect the device you're running it on. It may affect all your other data as well. So backups are very important and being very cautious and reading before you jump into and get, get these things. The idea is that... Yeah. Yeah. So avoiding early ones in particular and being aware of commentary on the internet about them before you jump in is a good idea. So as a general rule of thumb, if you're not sure, don't go there at all. Just wait till the public release. It's worth mentioning printers and scanners as a special category of things that have problems with new operating systems. 
mainly because man printer manufacturers and scanner manufacturers are very bad at supporting old products that they no longer sell. Mm -hmm. So once they've stopped selling it, they no longer care whether it works for you anymore. So if you upgrade your operating system, they may not release new software for you. Um, and I've encountered this, or I'm aware of people have encountered this with almost every brand. So particularly, Canon seems to be one of the worst ones at this. Um, I have seen it occasionally with Epson and HP as well. Brother tends to be better than the others as far as I can tell, because I've used Brother printers for a while and they've generally been pretty good at, at providing new drivers. I haven't yet got to the point where I've installed the new Brother drivers for my printer and scanner, but... Brother is one of the ones that I currently am getting warnings about 32-bit software for, so I need to deal with that in the next month or so. So that's one I'm aware of. Um, regardless of which country's drivers you're looking at, because some years ago um, a person in a computer shop said to me that um, often the drivers uh, are very incompletely displayed in New Zealand, and if you can get on to the... Yeah. Um, Unfortunately, the uh, what this next point I was about to make was um, generally what you should do is go to the New Zealand version of their website and go to the support section, the drivers and downloads, and search for what they've got available for that particular operating system that you want to run and the particular printer model. Um, what I've often found when I'm helping people with this is that if you go to the wrong country's website, you can't even find the model because they use different model numbers in different countries. And in some cases, they use the same model for something which is a totally different device in different countries. So you really do need to start with your own country's one as a first port of call. No, no, if you can't find it there, it's worth checking, widening your search a bit. So, for example, if the New Zealand site is missing a driver for your particular printer or the operating system, try the Australian one because it's close enough. Um, if you can't tr find it on the Australian one, it's worth trying some of the other countries just to see if you can find an, any driver for it. And I have certainly had cases where the driver was only actually distributed via the US website, for example, and you had to find the right variant of it. Um, so unfortunately, it's a bit hit and miss. You've got to have a hunt around. Um, yeah. And in some cases, what you find is that they may supply a driver, but they eliminate half the features in the process. Um, so, yeah, so we ha you have, for example, the scanning functionality no longer works. You have to use Apple's built-in scanning software rather than the nicer software that came with it in the first place. So they only bother right now the printed driver. They might d demote you to a lower functionality printed driver that is missing half the features you used to have. So this is often a problem. If it bu bugs you enough, remember the brand and don't buy it again <laughs> and buy something else to deal with the problem. <laughs> yes. Using third-party software is a, is a possible workaround, particularly with scanners. ViewScan, V-U-E-S-C-A-N, is a good third-party application which supports a huge range of scanners for doing general um, image scanning and document scanning. Um, and I've actually got one. Um, I've got a special document scanner, which is one from Fujitsu. It's called a ScanSnap. Um, and they are not updating the software for my older model, um, however, because I have a spare Mac, I just installed all the software on my old Mac. Uh, did I get that right? No, delete the last character. Uh, yeah. So, um, in fact, it's sitting, I noticed it's sitting right there. There's the ScanSnap manager is sitting there in front and centre. Plus, I found another application which claimed it supported the same printer called ExactScan. So I bought that a while ago, but haven't needed it yet. So I have t at least two ways of using that scanner. And this computer will be set up with the scanner able to be plugged into it whenever I actually need it. So I'll just use that computer to do it rather than my current one. So this is one of the possible solutions I'm going to come to shortly in terms of dealing with things that you still need for, in this case, supporting a peripheral in my case. Now I wanted to briefly go over the history. I, I'd actually created an entire probably half hour presentation on this but I've squeezed it down to two slides. <laughs> but part of it is this nice pretty picture I created. So I'll show you the nice pretty picture and I'll, and I'll just talk about it as I go. So, um, yep. So, a brief history of Mac platform transitions. So, starting in 1984 when the first Macintosh came out, it originally had a 68,000 processor. It progressed through 020, 030, 040, 040, which 68K is a general term for all of them together. And the last of those models were discontinued in 1996. So it's sort of like a 12-year span in which they released Macs using some variation of that processor family. Starting in 1994, Apple would introduce PowerPC Macs, originally the 601, 604, and they went to the 603, the G3, the G4, and the G5. The final models were discontinued in 2006. So that's about a 
12 year progression. What a coincidence. <laughs> or not, maybe. Um, now, interestingly, when they go from one processor family to another, you have the question of what happens to all the applications that ran on the old platform and how do they work on the new ones. So I'll come back to that point. Oh, here we are right now. Max, I've forgotten where I put it in the slide. Um, PowerPC Max, the new models, were able to run 68000 and 68020 software so well that it was almost impossible to tell that it wasn't running on a 68000 Mac. Apple did a really good job of emulating the older processor on the newer one. It actually directly ran the old instructions by converting them on the fly. So it looked at the instruction, worked out that's the same thing which is saying move a number to this register and add four to it. And so it does the same thing in software. So it basically does the whole thing in software and completely emulates it. Um, it was good enough that nearly all older Mac software worked fine. Notice, however, that there is two numbers missing there. There's no 68030 or 68040. The PowerPC 68K emulator did not emulate the extra features on those higher-end processors, so some software that needed the higher-end features didn't actually work on PowerPC Max and had to have some a bit of rewriting to work properly on PowerPC Max at the time. So it was only the more generic stuff that worked on all of them that worked fine. I've skipped a step in there, but it was getting too complicated. So just looking at this picture here briefly, it's not very legible, so you don't need to worry about that. I've got a timeline going vertically. Um, so starting at the top is 1984. I've drawn a big coloured block to represent the 68K Mac software from there to there. And then we've got a modification of it called 32-bit clean, if anybody remembers that little thing that happened with um, some of the 6030s, which goes from there to here, and possibly a bit further. I don't know, I need to scroll. Yes, that goes all the way down to here, so that's going down to 2007. And then we've got PowerPC starting in the, this column here, so the third column. So the arrows represent the ability of application developers to convert their software to run on the next type of platform. So people who wrote software for the first one could convert it to run the second one, could convert it to run the third one, etc., etc., working their way down. 1998. In 1998, we were talking about Mac OS 8.1 now, roughly. Apple, by this stage, had realised they needed a new operating system. We were running around in circles working out what it was, and they'd finally settled on Mac OS 10. They'd even gone and bought Next, including getting Steve Jobs back into the frame, and had um, a plan in place, but they hadn't actually released it yet. Part of that plan was this thing called Carbon. Now, what Carbon was is somebody who wrote an application which ran on the original Macs, right through to the all model up to that point, only had to make small modifications to their program to make it more able to run on a more powerful operating system. So, effectively, they took their existing program, did a few small tweaks, and it worked fine still on the old operating system, plus it would work fine on a new operating system without having to be emulated or anything. So that was quite an easy way for people to progress their old applications forward. So we're now getting down to this block. I'll scroll this list down a bit further so you can see we're going, we've got a way to go yet. So there's carbon we're talking about now. 2001, Mac OS 10 got released. Originally 10.0, um, and it was based on the next step operating system. So it was a complete change of architecture and everything. Nothing was in common with the old Mac operating system apart from they'd done enough changes to the user interface to make it similar enough that it wasn't too much of a glaring change for everybody. In order to support all the existing Mac software, they had effectively three solutions at the time. One of them was Carbon, which I've already mentioned. So people who had changed their applications to run in Carbon could run natively on Mac OS X. Second one was the classic environment. And the classic environment actually ran an entire copy of Mac OS 9 in the window inside Mac OS 10. Well, the window disappeared, and then you got to see just the applications there. So that's actually a virtual machine running another entire Mac inside Mac OS X, effectively. So you're running two operation, operating systems at the same time. You could run all the old applications, including 68K and PowerPC ones, alongside your Mac OS X applications. But they behaved quite differently because of the two different operating systems being quite different. They look quite different as well. They also introduced a third type of application called Coco. And Coco was basically applications that were originally written for the next step operating system now running on Mac OS X. So that was the, the direction that that came from. So you can see here, I'm now at this level here where we're around 2001. Here is Carbon, 
Here is this, this section of these ones are running under the classic environment under Mac OS X, and this yellow bit here is Cocoa. And I've chosen the colours deliberately because Apple called them the yellow box and the blue box <laughs> originally. Yellow box was the Cocoa stuff, blue box was the um, running Mac OS 9 stuff, actually not carbon, but um, it was easier for me to do it that way. Um, so you had effectively two diff completely different ways of writing applications, and they were able, both able to run at the same time natively on Mac OS X, plus the ability to emulate the old stuff. Okay, so three whole sets of different applications all running at once. Roll on 2006. Apple introduced Intel Macs. Intel Macs could not run the classic environment, so that cut off, for, at least for the new Mac models, all of the old original Mac software running under the classic environment, so that was the 68K and the older PowerPC software. They included this thing called Rosetta, which allowed PowerPC Mac OS X applications, which is the carbon group there, to still run on Intel Macs by effectively converting all of the PowerPC code into Intel code while it was running. So it was a bit like a, an emulator, but it was a slightly different way of doing it. So that allowed Cocoa and Carbon applications written for the PowerPC to keep running on Intel Macs, plus developers could rewrite their applications to run natively as Intel Macs, on Intel Macs as well. In 2007, Leopard dropped the classic environment, which meant that even PowerPC Macs could no longer run old 68K Macs uh, applications or old Mac OS 9 PowerPC applications. So that was one of the first major platform cutoffs that Apple did. Effectively, all of the old applications stopped working at that point. You couldn't run anything which required Mac OS 9 or earlier anymore unless you some, had some way of running the old operating system, say an old computer. In 2011, Lion removed Rosetta, which meant that you could no longer run PowerPC applications on Intel Macs. So that meant that all of the remaining PowerPC applications stopped working. So you were only left with Intel applications at that point. But those could still be Carbon or Cocoa. So if you look at here on my diagram, that is the end of the PowerPC column for Carbon, but the Intel column for Carbon keeps going. And similarly, the PowerPC column for Cocoa transitions to the Intel um, column for Cocoa, which keeps going. So you can see that if, as long as the application was rewritten to run natively on Intel, it kept working. But if it was still running PowerPC, it stopped working. In 2012, Apple started pushing the 64-bit stuff. They got rid of some of the 32-bit stuff at that point, and a few models got removed. Roll on to 2019. The next version, which is Catalina, is going to require 64-bit applications. So if I scroll down to the bottom of this list, which is as far as we've got, you will see that there is a dead end for the blue box here. So Carbon, the entire Carbon system, is 32-bit only. So all of the applications that may have originated right back on the original Mac, been ported through 68K, PowerPC, Carbon, converted to Intel, cannot run anymore as of Mac OS 10, 10.15, because that entire 32-bit capability is gone. The only way they can keep running is to rewrite a significant chunk of their application to run Cocoa, because you'll see that Cocoa, as long as it's 64-bit, which is the green box, keeps going. So 64-bit Cocoa applications are fine, 32-bit Cocoa applications are also gone. So there's a whole wad of old Mac software which will not work anymore unless the developer is maintaining it. So that 10.15's big cutoff is the all the 32-bit stuff is going. Okay, that that's the the brief history. Um, the very short version of it is here because I've got a much more, much longer version of it. Anybody wants to see the long version at some point? <laughs> more detail, basically. So some examples which I've encountered: Claris works and Apple works. If anybody remembers that those nice little applications. Claris Works first came out in the early 1990s. It was actually based on the Apple II GS and Apple II and Apple III versions of Apple Works and Apple Works GS, um, uh, loosely, at least. It was similar to the Apple II GS one because it was also a graphical user interface program. It was a, they included a word processor, a spreadsheet, a drawing module, a painting module, and database. The older versions had a um, communications module, later ones had a presentation module. Initially, it was a 68K application. It got updated through PowerPC. Up to version 5, it still ran on 68020 processors, so Apple was still maintaining compatibility with older Macs at that stage. 
Um, it got renamed to Apple Works rather than Claris Works while it was in version 5. At that stage, it was still a classic macOS application, so it ran on macOS 9 and earlier, or in the classic environment in macOS 10. On version 6, they dropped support for 68K, went PowerPC only, and changed it to Carbon, which meant it was now possible to run it natively on Mac OS X, as well as keep running it on Mac OS 9. And interestingly, version 6 on Mac OS 9 has a, some extra features which don't exist in the Mac OS X version of it, so it's not actually the same application running on both, it's slightly different versions of it. Apple, however, never converted AppleWorks to Intel, which means that if you wanted to run AppleWorks, it stopped working after Snow Leopard was the last version it could run on 10.6, which was using Rosetta. Every OS version after that which didn't have Rosetta could not run AppleWorks anymore because it was still PowerPC. So what did Apple do instead? They introduced iWork, which is sort of a replacement for AppleWorks. Functionally, at least, it sort of covers the same bases. <coughs> Keynote, which is the presentation software, was the first part. That came out separately as a standalone application, and they added pages when they started calling it iWork in 2005. It was originally PowerPC under Carbon running in Mac OS X. Numbers got added as part of iWork 08. iWork 06 was the first universal version. When you see an application is referred to as universal, that means it's got both PowerPC and Intel code, so it run at full speed on both PowerPC and Intel Macs so of that sort of era. These days it doesn't matter anymore, but back in the sort of early mid 2000s it was quite important because it made a big difference to the performance. Also it meant the application will keep working after Rosetta went away. iWork 09 was the last version of the sort of the initial development. That still worked on PowerPC Macs in if you, the very first version of it worked in Mac OS 10.10.4 Tiger. Um, however, later updates were Intel only, so PowerPC Macs couldn't run them, and the last versions required line or later, so you could only get version 4.3 if you updated your operating system um, to at least line uh, pages that is. Roll on 2013, and as, as everybody who's read my articles in the magazine over the years knows that they did a total rewrite and threw away the old applications and started again in, two, in late 2013. That was completely Intel only. They didn't need to support PowerPC anymore by then. Um, many, that should say, not May features dropped. So there's a typo there. Um, later updates gradually added back many but not all of the lost features. So each time we've come out with a new OS, they've done a slightly better version of it, and it's sort of good enough now that I'm able to use it again, but... Some people still don't want to use it because it's missing mail merge um, outlining and a few things like that. <laughs> Based on how it's behaving, iWork is 09 is probably a carbon application and it's definitely a 32 bit application. It works okay up till the recent versions, however, they started misbehaving in High Sierra. I found that um, Keynote no longer ran presentations, so I couldn't use Keynote anymore. I had to switch to the new version. And numbers started crashing in if you did certain things, so I had to be careful with numbers. Um, and initially, pages stopped working usably in Mojave. Um, it, wouldn't, uh, open any, it wouldn't let you open any documents anymore, but they seem to have fixed that at a later point in the operating system. So it actually does work again now, which was too late because I'd already switched from it. <laughs> None of them, however, will work in Catalina because of the 32-bit cutoff. So that's an example of a dead-end application, that particular version. However, the 32-bit version, sorry, the um, more modern versions are still being updated. They're 64-bit, they're fine, they'll keep working. So there'll be a new version of them, and they'll just work fine. So the old versions, at up to a point, you could stretch and stretch and stretch, but it was getting hard, and then it stopped working completely. But the new versions are fine. Microsoft Office. There were originally... 68K and Windows versions written separately of Office, and if people, anybody remember Word 5.1, which was the best version ever, I think, from judging by what everybody thought of it? Fondly. Fondly remembered Word 5.1, and the extremely disliked Word 6.0. Um, Office 4.2, they actually, Microsoft decided they didn't want to do any more work developing Mac applications, so they basically took the Windows version and ran it in a little conversion thing to look like uh, sort of like a Mac application, but didn't behave right. So everybody hated it. Um, so for the site, one update to that in 1994 was the first one which ran natively on PowerPC, and it was also the last version which ran on 68,000 Macs. So they were transitioning in a similar sort of way. Around this time, Microsoft were doing all sorts of horrible things, and people might remember the 1998 or 97 
um, I think it was a Macworld conference where Steve Jobs introduced Bill Gates via video and said that um, Bill Gates was, uh, Microsoft was donating lots of money to Apple and was going to commit to re releasing Office for the Mac for at least the next five years or something like that. This was um, it all very carefully crafted to avoid revealing the fact that Apple was going to sue Microsoft for large amounts of money because Microsoft had stolen lots of Apple code and this was a, actually a penalty payment in disguise um, to avoid Apple suing them. Um, at the time, Apple did need the money, but not not that it keeps getting quoted in the media as Microsoft saving Apple. In actual fact, it was only about 10% um, of Apple's revenue or something like that. So it wasn't a huge chunk of, it wasn't all that huge ch chunk of money. That It was mainly the commitment to Office being available, which meant that improved the viability of the Mac as a, as a business computer because up to that point it didn't, nobody knew what was happening with it. It hadn't been updated for several years. So Office 98 came out. It was a reasonably good application again. Still running on Mac OS 8 at the time, I think. Roughly, 8 or 9 by then. Office 2001 was the last version for Mac OS 9. That was still classic, so you could run it in the classic environment in Mac OS 10, but not in the... or in Mac OS 9. Then they came out with... Office V10, which was roughly late 2001. That was the first Mac OS X native version, which I remember well because I helped somebody use many copies of that a few years ago. That was a Carbon application written for PowerPC, so it worked up to Snow Leopard again using Rosetta on Intel Macs. Office 2004, also Carbon, also worked up till 10.6, but no further. So that, that was one that did not get ported to Intel. Office 2008 was the first Intel version, it was actually universal, so it still worked on PowerPC. It was still carbon and therefore 32-bit, so in theory it works up to Mojave, but it definitely does not work on Catalina. So that's one which will definitely die with Catalina. Office 2011, Intel only, so they got rid of the PowerPC stuff. Still carbon, still 32-bit, so again, even though it's not officially supported, it seems to work up to Mojave, won't work on Catalina. Office 2016, which is not the current version, but it's one behind it, um, it was the first Coco 64-bit version, so it will run on Catalina and later, so it's, it's fully up to date, um, though they've replaced it already with Office 2019. Um, however, it's worth noting that they've now got a policy that they only support the current operating system and the two versions prior to that. So if you want to be able to run the latest update of Office 2019 or Office 365, your operating system cannot be more than two versions out of date, or you won't be able to get the update to the application. So there is strict reinforcing there. So, for example, right now, you can run Office 2019 on Sierra, but in about two months' time when, uh, when Catalina is released, Microsoft will stop supporting Sierra, and you will no longer be able to get updates for Office 2019 on Sierra. You'll have to be running High Sierra, or a later version in order to get the latest update for Office 2019. Yes, the, the basic pattern they're doing is Office 365 is continually developed with new features all the time. Office 2019 is a feature frozen version at the point that they released that, that release. So it stays on that feature set for three years. And then they'll release a new version in about three years' time, and you have to buy that again if you want the new version. So uh, effectively, you're either subscribing to continually change, or you buy a version, keep using that, and then whenever you feel appropriate, you buy the next version. Um, pricing is generally cheaper to do it that do it the buy one version at a time rather than subscribing, but you do get extra features for the subscription model, um, like storage, online storage and things like that. Yep, so I just mentioned that. If you if you are at least three major macOS versions behind, you won't be able to install the latest Office, Office updates until you upgrade your operating system. Okay, so that's all I had to say on examples. I'm just using those three since they're well known, but there are lots of others I could, I could go through. I didn't want to rush into too many because it would take too long. So given you have essential but incompatible software, how do you keep it working? So here are some options. You can keep running an old, old Mac OS version on your main computer for a while, which I'll define shortly. You can find a replacement for the application, which is the, usually the best way to go if something's been abandoned and there's no way to get an update anymore. So it's, at some stage, it'll, you'll probably have to do that. 
you can set up your Mac so you can actually boot into an older operating system. So you can actually normally run a new operating system and then reboot it to run an old operating system to run the application, and then you can reboot it back again to go and run the new operating system again. That's a possibility. You can use another Mac to run the old software. Here is my example. I have moved most of my old 32-bit um, only applications and a few other things I don't really need on this computer onto a Mac Mini, and I have that running on my desk at home, and it just means I don't no longer have portable access to lots of old applications. Um, so if I just start that up, I think I've got a list of them here somewhere. I go notes. What have I got? So just as examples, I've mentioned the scanning, the scanner. Um, I've got Aperture version 3.6, the final version of Aperture. If anybody knows that, it's the basically the, the souped-up iPhoto with um, extra professional features. Um, what else did I have hiding in there? Um, old version of iTunes, which is still able to access the App Store, so I can download all my apps and keep backup copies of them. Um, Microsoft Office 2011, which I don't, I don't actually want to buy any version of Microsoft Office again and if I can help it, but I've still got that version which I paid for, so I've stuck it on this computer. On the rare occasion, I might need have no other way to access a Microsoft Office document that I actually need to run the real software for and not convert it to something else. Um, so that's I'm just keeping me on that computer and it doesn't normally run, so I'm not worried about it being out of date or insecure. Um, yeah, and a whole bunch of old things like old versions of FileMaker Pro, which don't work anymore, um, older developer tools, that sort of stuff. Um, my C I've got an older version of my CD writing software, which won't work on the latest operating system, that sort of thing. It's toast if anybody's dealt with that, that sort of thing. Or, and I've also used this solution, you can run a virtual machine on your Mac, so you can actually effectively run an old Mac OS version alongside your current Mac OS version and move some of your applications into the virtual machine to keep them working. So those are really the only serious options you should be considering, five possibilities. So, keeping an old Mac running for a limited time, you get two years of security updates after a Mac OS version is discontinued. So right now, Sierra is at the end of that point. That's 10.12. High Sierra's got one year to go. Mojave's got two years to go. Catalina effectively will have three years to go because it'll get released, get a whole year of normal updates, then two years of security updates. So right now, you should be moving away from Sierra as soon as you reasonably can if you're still running that version. High Sierra, you can delay it another year and not be too worried. So if the software, if your reason you're doing it is because you're running old software that you can't find a, a decent solution for, you should use that time to find a better solution because you can't stay there forever. <laughs> I know people who've tried and it got very, very painful for them um, to stay staying on an old operating system on their main computer and the worst cases that I've encountered recently, they were still on Snow Leopard um, and it was getting to the point that they couldn't use half of the, the internet because websites just weren't letting them access them. There was no available web browsers that supported their, um, those websites that would run that operating system, that sort of thing. Security would be poor too. Yes, it would. So it's a, it's a risk to keep running older operating systems for too long because the further you get out, out from behind the security updates, the greater chances that there's something that somebody might be able to attack you with without trying. It'll just happen when you happen to visit the wrong website. Um, so... A big problem, though, and it's getting—it's actually getting more serious now. There is an increasing there is increasing pressure from a variety of directions for things to require greater security. So this is not just websites. There are some applications I mentioned Microsoft Office requiring basically a security updated version of the operating system to continue getting updates. Skype is one that seems to be. Basically, we'll only bother supporting the last two operating systems or so, also from Microsoft, not a coincidence, probably. Um, but the number of websites that are doing things like requiring the latest versions of the um, secure connection protocol, which is only available if you're running Mac OS 10.12 or later. So if you're running 10.11, some websites don't work anymore, even though you can still run browsers that are supported on that version. You just can't access them securely because they don't support the right security protocol. So this sort of thing is pushing people to it being less viable to keep running older operating systems as a general use computer. Not such a problem if you have a special purpose computer for running one dedicated piece of software that you can't do any other way. That's not so bad. But basically, most internet-related stuff can't stay indefinitely on old computers for security reasons. 
You need to be able to run a supported web browser and sometimes a recent Mac OS version. Um, I just noted here that if you need to run an older operating system, you can still run a supported version of Chrome on Yosemite 10.10 .10, and Firefox on Mavericks 10.9. However, those limits are likely to go up at some point and they might jump several versions when they do. Um, I think Chrome went up one version, but the previous jump was three versions that went from Snow Leopard up to 10.9 in one go. So you can't assume that you, if, you're, if you're a little bit above that, you might be several years from the cutoff point. So, next solution is finding a replacement application or product. This is obviously, I can't explain how to go about this, it depends on the circumstances, but as a general rule of thumb, if, if an application has been abandoned by the developer for whatever reason, it's best to find a way to stop using it if you can. Um, obviously, if it's something like support software for a piece of hardware that still works fine, you can't, don't have that option. You need to keep using the hardware until it breaks. Once it's broken, maybe you should find rid of something else which no longer depends on the old software, That's that sort of thing. Um, and if you can't find a, a way to do it, similar way, think, see if you can think of a different way to achieve what it is that you need that old software for, um, as a sort of a general concept. Um, but this has to be obviously very general because it depends on the particular software. And of course the fallback option is to find some way to keep running the old software. So this is where the remaining options come into play. So, booting your Mac into an older operating system as well as running a current one. Big advantages, you don't have to buy another computer, you've already got the computer you want to run the old operating system on, so there's no extra cost. Big disadvantage, frequent restarts. You want to run an application for five minutes, you restart your computer. You run that application, you restart your computer, you go back to normal again. How long does it take to restart your computer? How much disruption does that cause to your workflow? It's a pain in the neck. And I did this briefly many, many years ago and rapidly got sick of it, so decided I wouldn't bother doing it ever again. <laughs> so don't try that method, basically, is my advice, because it's too much of a pain. On the other hand, if the thing you need to run in the old operating system is something you run for an entire day, for example, and then you stop using it and you go back to normal, that's a bit more practical. Um, because then you are dedicated to doing one task, say it's some machinery controller or something like that which you're doing for an entire day, you shut the computer down, you then start it up again normally the next day to do something else. So that's not so bad. But if you're having to frequently switch back and forth, it's just too much pain. Also worth noting, if you buy a new Mac, your new Mac will not run the old operating system because Macs only run the operating system that they was, a, was the current one when they were released and newer versions. So if you need to run an old operating system to run old software, you need a Mac which is old enough to run that operating system. Therefore, don't buy a new Mac. If your current one dies, you no longer have this option of booting your now new Mac into the old operating system because you can't do that. So it's important to keep that in mind. As a temporary solution, you can do this, but <laughs> not a permanent solution. It's also rather messy to set up. You've got to partition your computer, so you have two different partitions, one running the old operating system, one running the new operating system, or use an external drive which you can boot from to run the old operating system. If, you, if the versions in question happen to be high Sierra or later and you can use APFS, there is a slightly nicer option. You can actually create two volumes on the same partition for APFS and they can then boot either one of them. That's less disrupt, disruptive because you no longer have to make a arbitrary decision about how much space is going that way and how much space is going that way because they can share free space so that's easier but still requires rebooting so it's still painful you need the installer for the old OS Mac OS version obviously if you're going to reinstall it and it's easiest to set this sort of procedure up while you're still running the old Mac OS version because installing a newer one running a newer one and trying to install an older one is very tricky you've got to actually go through extra steps but you can do it also worth noting, if you have a Mac with a T2 chip, which is effectively all 2018 or later models with the exception of the 2019 iMac, plus the 2017 iMac Pro is, is included. So this is a new security chip that Apple's including in all of their new computers. So it adds all sorts of nice features, but one of the features it's got is by default, it won't let you boot your computer from an external drive. If you want to do that, Apple has a support article explaining how to turn that feature off. <laughs> Which I, I have a 2018 Mac Mini, so I've played with this feature briefly and I've used it just to confirm that, yes, I can boot that computer from an old from an external drive if I need to. So, Third option, use another Mac. 
This is your easiest solution. Find a Mac which can run the operating system you need, set it up and run the software you want on it and then separate it from your main computer. Um, I have Mac, a Mac Mini which I'm dedicating to that task. I've installed Sierra on it um, so I can run anything that runs on Sierra which includes all my 32-bit software. Um, I chose that version in particular because of high Sierra having started to have problems with iWork. By going back one to Sierra, it means I can still run the old iWork applications on there. So I've stayed with Sierra. I know it's going to stop getting security updates. I don't tend to use that computer for anything significant internet related. It just occasionally gets used for things. And I've got my current Mac for accessing the internet. So I'm not worried about it being outside the security update window. It's cheaper than a virtual machine if you have a spare old Mac already and your internet stuff just stays on a new Mac, so that's the advantage, so you don't have to worry about the old Mac losing compatibility with the internet. Disadvantages, you might need to buy another Mac if you haven't got a spare one. Trade Me is a good source. I bought lots of I'm, uh, lots of Mac minis on Trade Me. Um, you also need more space. You've now got two computers to look after rather than one, so you need more disk space or wherever you put it. And also you've then got to deal with the, how do I get files back and forth. So it's more complicated than just having one computer because you've got to be able to transfer files back and forth when you need to copy something from one to the other or whatever it might be. But it might be. Cloud solutions are quite handy for that or in a pinch USB flash drives but they're a nuisance because they're quite slow. External hard drives. File sharing over a network is usually the easiest option if you understand it. Um, don't forget you also need to back up the other Mac not just your main one, because if you lose your old one, you've lost everything on it, including all your old software. So you now have two Macs to back up. And I don't think I've started backing that one up yet, but I'm not worried because everything I've installed on it is in recent backups of this Mac, since I've only started this process recently. But by the time I'm finished, I'll be doing time machine backups of that one separately from this one. Obviously, you need an old enough Mac which can run the old OS version. I'm not going to go into details there because the variables, there's too many variables, but if you do need advice on that, I know all the details almost off the top of my head, so I can, I can advise you on what exactly you need. If you know which OS version you want, I can point you in the right direction. Of course, if the old Mac dies, you need another old Mac, not another new Mac. <laughs> so keep that in mind. The longer you leave this, the harder it will be to find a model which is old enough and still in good enough condition that it's able to run the older software. So the longer and longer this goes, I still have a working Power Mac 8600 running Mac OS 9. I think. I haven't turned it on recently. I hope it still works. <laughs> I had a Power Mac G4 Quicksilver 2002 running Mac OS 10.4. Its power supply died. I have yet, after six months, to find the same model again. Uh, so I've, I've temporarily worked around it by getting a slightly newer Mac Mini and a slightly older Power Mac G4, which doesn't run 10.5, so I've got a, this now gap in what I could run with older operating systems. So it does get more complicated the longer you leave it. So I'm deliberately keeping old things so I can still run old software, mainly for conversion reasons if somebody needs something converted, but I do have a few old Macs running various different old operating systems if I need them. There was... Apple, no, it's a, it's an, this is a big desktop G4 model, like, you know, like the Tap Mini Tower. It's got a power supply about yay big. They use that model of power supply in precisely two models. <laughs> the log model after it and the model two before it have completely different power supplies. And I it died so recently enough that the only source I could find from overseas had already sold out of all the spare ones, and they have no more spare ones. So it was already at a point where you have to get refurbished power supplies that somebody had pulled out on the machine. So I'm basically waiting until I see, I get lucky and find find another one of the, the same model or the one just before it, which I can then start swapping parts around and end up with the working Franken, Franken Mac, <laughs> if you like. But I can actually... In that respect, I have got a Power Mac G4 at home. But it has to be a Power Mac G4 Quicksilver. I already have two Power Mac G4 digital audios, which is two generations older, so I have a workaround. It's still in physical box. Yeah. But if it's not the Quicksilver, which is the plain silver front cover, not the later one with the mirror drive doors, um, then that's the one I need. But if it's the older ones, I've got them already. I've got two working ones that already. I've got a spare one just in case that that one died. So and these are these are. Yay, big! So I've got three of them sitting side by side. I don't, don't I can't bear to throw out my nice top of the line Quicksilver 2002. That was my, that was my replacement for my PowerBook G4, which died completely when I got my first Intel laptop. So I'm, I'm I have history on this area. I know, I know that old computers die. So I'm just trying to make sure I keep a working one that can run everything uh, if possible. In fact, um, 
while I'm thinking about it, let me just show you this. No, I don't have it open. Um, file, open recent. I have a, I've created a spreadsheet to keep track of which versions of operating system I can run on my various Macs. I have the ones I coloured in pink are either dead or semi-dead computers. So I have a, a, a Power Mac G4, Power Mac 7600, which is my original Mac, which I've still got, in the basement, so I don't know what condition it's in. It got indirectly struck by lightning in, 2000 and, in 1997, which blew up a serial port. So it sort of works, and I don't, but I don't trust it. So I got the 8600 to replace it, and that one still works. So those two can run up to 9.1 and potentially back to 7.5. Um, I have a dead SE30, which I need to see if I can resurrect, but I suspect it's long gone by now. Um, they're my two Power Mac G4s. They can run 9.1 through 10.4. My dead Quicksilver 2002 could run 9.2 through 10.5. I've got a Mac Mini 2005 that covers the top end of what the old one could run. I have a faulty iMac, which somebody gave me, which I'm going to get rid of because it's unreliable. It crashes reasonably predictably, but not always, <laughs> um, which could run 10.4 Intel up to 10.11. So I got two Mac Minis to replace that one, a 2007 and a 2009. So the 2007 covers the bottom end, 2009 covers the top end. Um, so I got a spare 2009 because one of those was my server, which was important. The 2010 is actually a surplus to requirements one. I have a 13-inch MacBook Pro, which somebody gave me, which covers 10.6 up till 10.13. So I've got, I'm well covered around this area, as you can see. And I bought more recent Mac Minis for special purposes. And my, my current computer is that one there. And that Mac Mini is that one. So between the two of them, I can run 10.8 eight up to future versions, but um, I needed to get uh, some of them in my family members' computers as well, so that's the, that's Matt and Suz's ones. Um, I got a spare Mac Mini so I could run testing new operating systems, and I bought a new Mac Mini 2018 recently, which, as you can see, can't run very much yet because it's so new. can't run anything older than 10.14 on it, so it's currently not doing very much, but it's, it's, it will become more important as it goes forward. So I covered... I've got every version of the operating system covered by at least one computer, so I can run any software that needs any OS, OS version right back to 7.6 at least, hopefully, um, um, as long as the computer doesn't die. But in some cases, I've only got one computer that can do that, so I prefer to have two as this, so I've got a backup. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm, I know Graham's got a collection of old stuff, so I'm, I'm not too worried if one, some of my older ones die. But it's the it's the sort of the around the Intel early Intel area is where it gets messy. So um, I've got enough to cover that. So I'm just keeping my eye out for any other others that fill the gaps. Um, I'll just continue that again. So we got up to there, didn't I? Yep. So I need another old Mac. Um, to set up the other Mac, you best to erase it reinstall the operating system from scratch and then install the software. Don't try and clone your current Mac onto it unless you're already running the same version and you're going to then sort of separate them out and it's just a bit uglier doing it that way. Um, this is a bit technical so I've skipped, skipped the details but it's easiest if you have the same user account name on both computers and preferably the same user account ID number which is hidden. Now you can go and I can I can give you directions where to go to find it. I've done a more complete version of this presentation where I've listed the details for that. Um, but if you have the same name, it's easier to handle things like file sharing because you just log in with the same name, same password. Um, and the ID numbers is helpful if you're moving external storage around because then the files are owned by the same person on each computer. Um, so it's good to know how that works. Because if you reinstall, you don't get the bug fixes that you've... No, you, re you reinstall the operating system, you install the software updates to bring it up to date again, so you get all the security updates and everything like that. Yeah. Now, how are we going for time? I think we're oh, not getting late-ish at quarter to ten, so I'll, I'll whip, th whip through this quickly. Um, if anybody wants a copy of this, I'm going to make the, this version of the presentation and the full version, which goes into basically everything I've said, not just the summary points on here, um, available shortly via our website. I'll just tidy it up a bit more, so I'll, I'll wait till after the capital meeting before I distribute it. But don't panic if you miss, miss some details here. Okay, so virtual machines, effectively this lets you run two operating systems simultaneously. You've got one called the host, which is the one that your Mac's running normally, and one called the guest, which is running inside the virtual machine software. And what you see on your computer is a window running the old operating system alongside everything else your new operating system is doing. So it's 
effectively you've got a Mac inside a Mac. If you have enough disk space, you can have more than one old Mac OS version, and as people who've observed my computer at these meetings will be aware, I've got every Mac OS version back to 10.5 set up as a virtual machine right now. So I've got, I can cover all versions, recent versions, so just so I can quickly test things. I find that's very handy if I'm answering questions from people running a particular version, because I can just run the same version and see what it, exactly what it looked like and tell them where to go to find things, that sort of thing. Um, it does, however, take up a substantial portion of my computer storage, and I'm potentially going to push some of it off to external drives and that sort of thing. You need to tell some people to upgrade so you don't need to. Well, the problem is they've got an old Mac that only runs up to a certain point. They can't upgrade unless they replace the computer. Um, but also, I do have um, certain applications that only worked up to a particular point. So i got, for example, I've got a working copy of AppleWorks in my Snow Leopard virtual machine. So there'll be some of these that I keep indefinitely because I want to be able to keep running those, soft, those applications on rare occasions. So, for example, I've got a working version of Bento running in... I think in Mavericks or something like that, 10.9, I've, I've, I've noted down which one I've got them in as I built a list there recently. So I, that's my solution for specific applications I might want to run occasionally. I don't use them for things I run frequently because it's just inconvenient to, to start another virtual machine. Yes, I'll come to that. Yep. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. That's, that's actually easier. So um, the big advantage of a virtual machine is physical space not storage space, because there's only one computer to deal with, not two physical computers, so you don't have to worry about space to put another computer alongside your main one, and the convenience of having everything in one computer, and portability, particularly for a laptop. Um, so it means I can bring, I've got, on one laptop I have, in fact, 10 Mac OS 10 versions, 11, it must be, it must be you know, it's going to be 11 shortly, um, plus two Windows versions, plus Linux and MS-DOS. <laughs> so I've got 14 virtual machines at the moment running all those operating systems. So I can run any of those easily to run something specific which requires that operating system. It is more complicated. So if you would prefer an easy solution, having another Mac to run, the, run your software is much easier than running a virtual machine because there's less fiddly stuff to deal with because the virtual machine you need to get your head around how things are working in a few, in a few ways. It also has higher system requirements and there's much more cost involved um, because you have to buy the virtual machine software to run the old operating system and you have to upgrade it on, if you, uh, on a regular basis. Potentially every year. Um, I've generally found that every year they come out with a new version just after Apple releases new operating systems. There's a new virtual machine version for both Parallels and VMware. And they only officially support the new operating system, the latest version of their software. The previous one might work, might not. So sometimes I've, I've been able to get away with not upgrading in one year, but I do have to the next year. Often I've had to upgrade every year, so it gets rather expensive as you have to... But I'm doing this for 15 virtual machines, so it's worth it in my case. If you're doing it for a single virtual machine for one piece of software, it may not be worth the expense. Then there are the system requirements. Think about the fact that you are effectively running two Macs at the same time in one computer. So you need preferably four CPU cores in your real Mac because if you've only got two, you have to give two of them to the virtual machine, which leaves none for your real computer. So they're fighting over the CPU cores all the time, which slows everything down. If you've got four CPU cores at least, you can have at least two working on your main computer and two on the virtual machine, so that's more, more practical. Having said that, this machine's got four cores. I'm able to run three virtual machines, each with two cores at the same time, and everything seems to run comfortably. Though I'm not pushing it hard. <laughs> I'm just running them all so I can look at something and then shut one of them down again or something like that. So four CPU cores is a very good idea. Two will work but will be slow. Ideally, you want at least eight gigabytes of RAM because you need to dedicate... Basically, the virtual machine permanently reserves while it's running all the memory for the virtual machine. So it's usually two gigabytes for most Mac OS X virtual machines. So basically, that will permanently tie up two gigabytes of your memory, which would be half your memory if you've only got four gigabytes. So that will really constrain your Mac. So eight is the minimum I recommend. In some cases, you might need 16 if you're running complicated software as well as the virtual machine. You'll need at least something in the order of 30 gigabytes to create a virtual hard disk for the virtual machine because you've got effectively, an, it's like a partition, in effect. It's actually a file on your Mac's drive. It's easier to manage than a partition. But 
it's big and you've got to have the entire operating system plus all the applications plus free space for it and so on and that's about 30 gigs seems to be a reasonable number for the Mac stuff. Then there's a the problem that some applications don't actually work in virtual machines so it's helpful to know what whether your particular case will work. The usual reasons they won't work is hardware, if it has a dependency on some specific technical feature which you cannot physically get to. The obvious example is you can't connect to anything which uses Firewire or Thunderbolt from inside a virtual machine, however you can use USB and Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and networking, I didn't build to mention that because that's, that's the essential if that didn't work. Um, there is no 3D graphics support, so if anything needs a graphics processor, a dedicated graphics processor, it will not work in a virtual machine. And there is a surprising example. iWork09 does not work in a virtual machine because it requires 3D graphics. As I discovered much to my horror when I tried to set up my preferred virtual machine solution, which is why I went to the separate computer. What happens if you run pages, numbers, or Keynote 09, you get a window with a border around the edge and a big blank white rectangle where the document should be. You can't see any of the content of the document you're working on because it's using a feature called Quartz Extreme, which requires 3D graphics hardware to render the content of the window. <laughs> and that does not work because there is no 3D hardware as far as the virtual machine is concerned. <laughs> this is apparently a limitation of what Apple has provided to the virtual machine companies because none of them can do it. It's not, it's not a limitation of any particular one version. All of them have got the same problem. So, if you want to run iWork09 in particular because you really like it, you need another Mac. There are two options for the software, Parallels Desktop and VMware Fusion. And I've list listed the links to their websites there. Both of them happen to cost, give or take $5, <coughs> about $140 for the non-pro version to buy, and every potentially every year you're looking at $90 to upgrade to the next version. So that gets factor that in for a few years and it starts to add up to the cost of a new Mac or a second-hand old Mac. So uh, if you're really only wanting to run this for one thing, it's easier to go with a spare, spare computer. Also worth noting, if you're thinking about trying this soon, they're probably going to be updated within the next three months because there's going to be a new Mac OS version and both of them will release new versions. Therefore, if you buy them now, you'll probably be paying an upgrade in three months' time because they probably only have a one-month free upgrade period. They do have free trials, and in fact, I have installed the free trial of Parallels just like so I could demonstrate it tonight if anybody wants to see it. I've already already had VMware Fusion. It is worth mentioning there is a, another application called VirtualBox, which is free, and it is apparently quite good at running Linux or Windows in a virtual machine. However, their macOS support is, quote, experimental, unquote, to the extent that it defeated me. I tried for at least an hour yesterday attempting to boot the installer in VirtualBox, and I failed. <laughs> if I can't do it, the chances of somebody else doing it are slim. I think I know where I went wrong. I don't really care enough to try again. <laughs> but the instructions I found on the internet did not work. The, they did not, the documentation didn't match the, the release notes of the current version, so I didn't trust what they said anyway. Even if I got it working, the fact that it's experimental, it may not work well enough. So I decided, no, why even bother trying? So if it worked and it worked well enough, it would be a cheaper option, but I think it's worth going there. Of the two major options, Parallels tends to be the more sort of whiz-bang latest features, whereas VMware Fusion is more staid and solid and business-like. So I went with the one that I thought was going to be more stable. Um, Parallels, actually, now that I've seen it running on, on a Mac OS client, has actually got a few nice features, so there are some advantages to running it. Um, there may be a few disadvantages that it's more likely to be sort of cutting edge and a bit unstable. So my gut feeling is that VMware is probably a safer more steady option. Parallels is, if you'd like it to be more Mac friendly, then go with Parallels. And I know that, Lisa, you're running Parallels, for example, for your um, Windows virtual machine, for which is fine. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's working well for you, isn't it? It's not causing any major problems. So I've just run the trial version and it seems to run fine, so I'm not concerned about it in terms of not working. Just so you've seen that, so you can. Yeah. 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 So a lot of things that cross over, I don't do anything. Just mm. Yeah, and I found that 
Um, I mentioned earlier, for example, that you effectively running the Mac OS inside a window. VMware Fusion only offers the ability to run the guest Mac OS inside a window, but Parallels appears to also support what they call coherence for Mac OS guests, where you can have just the windows of the Mac application alongside your normal ones, so it hides the fact that it's running inside another Mac, um, which is a bit nicer. Um, but it does mean it sort of obscures the detail that it's not actually the same computer, which could be a bit confusing. Um, I haven't had a close look at that, so... Um, I wouldn't bother with those. I didn't ask to have it mm. for my family history program. Yeah, yeah. So to set the virtual machine up, you need the install Mac OS application for the version you want to run. And basically, both of these work the same way. You give them the application. They created a bootable disk image. They boot from it. They install the operating system. From there, it's just a, a, like running another, another Mac, effectively. So um, only thing I noticed was with Parallels was it's geared more heavily towards running Windows, so it offers immediately to go and download a Windows and sort of from Microsoft, and you have to sort of cut it off at the knees and tell it, no, I don't want to do that, and push it in the right direction to get it to go and do a Mac one instead, but it was, wasn't too hard to find. Um, so once it's all set up, the VM is like a separate Mac running inside a window in your Mac, as I mentioned, and if you want to copy files back and forth, you're basically dragging and dropping inside and in and out of the window, or using file sharing, or you can have a dedicated shared folder and move files through that or something like that. It's quite straightforward. I found just moving things back and forth between my real Mac and my virtual Macs. Um, it's important to point out that as with another Mac, you've got to back up your virtual machine if it's got important stuff in it. Don't use Time Machine on the real Mac to back up the virtual machine. Now, in fact, you can get away with that for Parallels because they've got a workaround where they actually take a copy of some of the stuff inside the virtual machine and keep a separate copy which can be backed up, but then it uses a lot more disk space. So do you want to waste disk space just to make it easy to back up your entire virtual machine is the question. VMware, it is not safe to use Time Machine to back up VMware virtual machines at all. Um, theoretically, you could do it if it's shut down while you're doing the backup, but it's, um, they originally had it automatically excluding the, v the virtual machine folder from the backups, and I've done that manually to make sure I don't accidentally back them up and break things. So the best way of doing that, if you want to back up the entire virtual machine, I you rely on clones. So I use Time Machine backups to back up nearly everything on my computer. I use occasionally updated clones to back up all my virtual machines because they're not doing anything day-to-day -day critical, they, they get updated occasionally. I'm not too worried if I have to end up going back several months or weeks, however long I did my last clone, to re reinstate an old version, so that's fine. You can also run Time Machine inside the virtual machine, so you can actually back up, inside, basically running like another Mac, so you just run Time Machine on the, in there and back it up to its own drive. That would work fine. Um, Getting the Mac OS installer, I'll skip this through this very quickly, but there's all sorts of horrible rules for these, and it varies depending on the version. Um, if you want to get Sierra or Hi Sierra, they're reasonably easy. You can download them from, via support articles that take you to the App Store. Main thing to be aware of is you have to be running the same operating system or earlier. Earlier on, I mentioned if you want to start setting up another Mac or another boot volume or something, it's best to do it while you're still running the old operating system because then you can get the installer. <laughs> if you've already upgraded, you can't download the installer for the old operating system. Even if you want to run a virtual machine, it won't let you. Um, so my usual solution to that is have another Mac still running an older operating system on which I can download the newer operating system installer um, the, 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 for a different machine. So there's the sort of twists and roundabouts you have to do to get, get around all these sort of rules that Apple's imposed. And you also need to be able to run the version of the installer that you're downloading. You can't download, for example, a Catalina installer on a 2007 Mac because it's too old. Um, so um, you have to have a Mac which is capable of running the version that you want to download. Again, if you can't get it, ask me. I've got enough Macs that I can get it <laughs> for you. Now, one point you mentioned earlier, Margaret, about virtual machines <coughs> and what they can run. Excuse me, I'll just take a sip. Running the native operating system on the Mac, there is a minimum version that can run, but for a virtual machine there is no minimum because the virtual machine hardware is compatible all the way back to Mac OS 10.5. So you can actually run on any current Mac, you can run all the way back to 10.5. You can also run newer versions, theoretically, than what your Mac's capable of. 
Um, that's a bit more messy though, so it's generally better not to do that. But if necessary, you can do that. Um, and occasionally I use that just to test the next operating system as one of the ways that I can easily access it, that sort of thing. But you need to have a VM software which is compatible with the new operating system first to do that. So that's, that's, that's the catch. But certainly I've had no trouble running anything right back to, to 10.5. You have to use the server version for the oldest ones. I've got that mentioned a bit further on. But for 10.7 and later, you just need the installer. So if you already had it from a previous download or you can get it from your App Store account or something, you can, you can still do it that way. El Capitan is the annoying one. Apple imposed a silly rule with this one. You can only download El Capitan on a Mac that is unable to run Sierra or later. <laughs> they won't let you download it and let, except on a Mac that needs it. <coughs> So you either have to be running really, really old operating system like Snow Leopard, or or you need to be on a Mac which is pre two thousand and nine, late earlier than late two thousand and nine. Otherwise, they won't let you download it. I don't know why they did this because it's the only one that's got that rule. But it's a weird exception. So if you have, for example, a two a, a two thousand and twelve Mac Mini, and you want to install El Capitan in a virtual machine, I can't download it on that computer. It won't let me download the El Capitan installer because this machine is able to run Sierra. I would need a 2000, early 2009 computer or older to be able to download the El Capitan installer. Well, the App Store still on that because chances are that, say, yeah. the browser won't work. Yeah, yeah it does, yeah. So the extreme case is if you have an old enough Mac, you can actually get, you can install Snow Leopard on it, run App Store, update it at 1068, run App Store on 1068, and still download El Capitan from there, for example. So yeah, I tried yeah, that was fine. The, the old old web browsers don't work, but App Store is they they've, they've allowed an exception to the security rules because there's no other way to get some of these later operating system stores. You've got to have a new enough operating system before you can get them. Yeah. The other exception is 10.10 and 10.9. There is if you didn't already have them, get them while they were the current version. As soon as they were superseded, Apple removed all ways of getting them unless you could re-download the copy you'd already have got. It, they were free, but Apple basically removed the ability for latecomers to get them. So the only way you can get them now is if you'd already got them in the past and you've still got access to them via your purchase history and app store. If you don't have them in that list, you cannot download those versions full stop. So... Usually not a big problem because you can just pick a different version either side of the, that gap. But sometimes their applications only worked up to one of those versions and you might want to run them for a particular reason. I, I got every version, so I've got them <laughs> for my, myself, but I can't give those to anybody else because not, you're not licensed to use it. 10.7 um, and 10.8, those are the last two versions that Apple sold rather than being free. You can still buy them. I checked. Um, they're, they're available from the online Apple store. Um, you can just do a search on Apple's website for them by name and easily find the links to download them, um, or to buy them, I should say. They cost $35 each, um, and what they do is they email you a redemption code. You then go into App Store and enter the redemption code via the Redeemer code thing, and then it adds that version to your purchase history, and then it downloads it. Again, only on an older system. So you can do that from Snow Leopard, for example, but not from anything more recent. So you can get those versions as long as you're on an older Mac still. And well, there's, there's the links, but it's easy to find them by searching on Apple's website by name. And Snow Leopard. You can still buy Snow Leopard on DVD, also for $35 from Apple's online store. Again, go to the store, go to Apple's website, search for Snow Leopard. Um, they supply it on a DVD. It's version 10.6.3. Um, and you, you, so obviously you need a DVD drive to use it, so you might have to go and find one of them as well. But your, and your Mac has to be a 2011, uh, um, no, 10. At 2011 models, you can't use that copy of Snow Leopard because the DVD is too old for the model. 2010 models are also in that group. You have to be a 2009, 8, 7 or 6 model to use that particular Snow Leopard DVD. Um, I've been gradually accumulating some other Snow Leopard installers that came with 2010 and 11 Macs. So I've got a few of them now. So if you need to install it on one of those versions, I may have a copy of the original DVD, so check with me. Um, 
It's worth noting if you want to run 10.6 in a virtual machine, you can't use the normal version of Snow Leopard. You have to use the server version because Apple's licensing terms said that the normal version of Snow Leopard is only allowed to be installed once on the computer. The server versions are allowed to be installed multiple times as long as you've got a separate license for each copy. So therefore, all the virtual machine software enforces that rule by disallowing installation of the non-server edition. You've got to buy the server one instead, and it's only available via phone call from it to, to the Apple Store number. And then you've got to convince them that you what the product you actually want is and that they keep trying to sell you the wrong one because they don't even know it exists anymore. So I've been through this exercise before. I've got all the details written down somewhere. I just didn't dig, dig them out to repeat them here. So if you do need it, talk to me. I think I've even still got a spare copy because I bought three last time because I didn't want to have to go through it again. So I've got one I'm using and one I sold to somebody else and I think I've got a spare one left. So if you do need to run Snow Leopard in a virtual machine, talk to me. <laughs> If you really want to run 10.5, you also need the server edition. Um, and that one was even harder because Apple never made it cheap. It was originally 500 US dollars. Um, the same with the Snow Leopard server, but they dropped the price to the same as normal version eventually. But Leopard server was horrendously expensive. I got a second-hand copy from one of my clients when they decommissioned their computer. And I think I paid 100 bucks for it or something like that at the time. But I think you can still find copies on Amazon for rather a lot less than originally cost. But there's generally no point... Um, Snow Leopard does more than Leopard, with one exception. If for some reason you need to access an Apple Talk printer, Leopard is the last version that could do that. <laughs> That's it. I've reached the end of that bit. Now, just for quick reference, if you want, if anybody wants them, I have actually done some associated presentations for this. Not there, that one. Um, I actually did a presentation covering in more detail all of the various platform changes that Apple's gone through, if you're interested in just reading that at some point, just the history and including a little, little timeline at the end in a spreadsheet. Um, and in the full version of this presentation, I had a whole section at the end which I've cut out of the, what we've actually shown tonight, which is explaining why applications stop working in new operating system versions and um, why, what the reasons are behind it, and what, um, and what to expect typically in a, in a, on a yearly, yearly cycle of new operating system updates, that sort of thing. So some people might want to read that, so I've just left it on the end of the main presentation, but I took it off the one we've seen tonight. <laughs> hmm. Otherwise we'd be here for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Thank you, folks.